And going through the book of 1 John as a, as a church family on our Sunday nights and looking forward to the passage here as we come toward the latter part of 1 John chapter number 2 as we begin to open up God's Word and look at it and see the truth that John was trying to impart to the people during that time, the saints during that time, around AD 85, 80, 85 to 90, somewhere right in that time frame was when this book was written. But it's amazing how even though the Bible, this part was written over 2,000 years ago, it still applies today. You know why that is? Because God wrote it. Now, when I was in college, I read Shakespeare. Shakespeare was written a long time ago. It doesn't really apply to today. I mean, it's, there's some interesting things, but it, you, you read the Bible, and boy, it hits you square between the eyes, doesn't it? Man, it gets you. That's because the Word of God is quick and powerful. It's alive and powerful. Whether it was written 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, God's Word is alive. It applies to us today. So let's look at 1 John chapter number 2, beginning in verse number 18, if we could please tonight, where John says, Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Those first two verses, we'll continue on, but just a thought. Those first two verses begin to paint the scene for this next section of Scripture. He references in, in uh, verse 18 twice uh, the word antichrist and antichrists. We live in a day and age where, where people have made movies and books and, and written books about this concept of the antichrist. The one central figure in the end of the world times that will, that will stand up against our Savior, against our God, will have some limited victory and ultimately will be shut down by the power of God. And John says some things about that to us tonight. Verse number 20, But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is anti-Christ that denieth the Father and the Son. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. What's our theme for this year? One more time, what's our theme for this year? Continue. Hopefully when you walk in the auditorium, you see this here. Continue in the verse, but continue on the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. On that side as well, on the screen at, at times, and on the wall. We want you to continue. And, and John here says, I want you to continue. How? I want you to continue in the Son and in the Father. That would be a good thing for us to continue in the Son, Jesus Christ. Not get sidetracked by the cares of this world, sidetracked by other false doctrine. We'll look at that tonight. But to continue in the teaching and the truth and abiding in Jesus Christ. Just continue. He says, continue in the Son and in the Father. Verse 25, and this is the promise that we, he hath promised us even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. Lord, I thank you for this passage of Scripture for this time. Lord, I pray that you would guide my thoughts. Lord, would you work in our hearts, take your word, please, and would you magnify it in your sight and in our hearts as listeners tonight, Lord? Would you please accomplish everything that you desire to? And Lord, I'm asking that your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I'm asking that we'd be good to soil, we'd respond the way we ought to to it. Lord, that we'd take the truth and be challenged and, and correct things in our life, Lord, that aren't pleasing to you. Lord, bless this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. I've entitled this message, Caution, Danger Ahead. You ever seen these different signs, road closed to through traffic? You ever gone past those things because they don't apply to you? They don't apply to me? They apply to everyone else who's driving a vehicle. Bridge closed ahead. Ha, is it really closed? 
Or are they just placing random signs out there? Because the, roads crews have, the road crews have nothing better to do than to place random bridge out signs. They say, according to a blog, that we live in the age of warning labels. I can identify with that thought. It seems like there is a warning on everything. Even now, a warning on your McDonald's coffee cup, warning contents may be hot. Well, thank you. That's what I wanted it to be. If I wanted an iced coffee, I would order an iced coffee, but I don't I want a hot coffee, so give me one that's hot, not lukewarm or tepid. I, I can identify with the scripture where Jesus says about the Christians, if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. No one wants to drink lukewarm coffee. Give me some hot coffee, but don't warn me about it. I expect it to be quite warm, but of course you may recall why they do that is because a few years back a lady spilled hot coffee on her and lo and behold it was hot so she sued because it was hot and so now they must warn people that it's hot we live in the in the age of warning labels in fact someone said this chances are you encounter so many warning labels on a daily basis that you no longer bother reading them how many would say that's true pastor I don't read warning labels take this medicine warning you're like oh okay that looks safe enough Glug, 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 glug. You ever look at the warning label on different tools that you use and the, the things they tell you not to do? In fact, there was a warning label on a, on a hair dryer that said, do not use while sleeping. <laughs> I was tempted. It was close. I'm not a sleepwalker, but if you were, I'd, I'd film that. And they said, even if you do, it's nearly impossible to determine if a product represents a true hazard or if you're just encountering a bunch of words designed solely to avoid lawsuits. That's the day and age we live in. They're, they're saying everything. So, in fact, I saw this warning label on a wheelbarrow, not for highway use. <laughs> now, I want to know why they had to put that on there. In my mind, it works that way. I know why they put the one in the coffee cup for McDonald's. So I'm thinking one day this guy looks up. He's like, he works for DeWalt. And he says, wait a second, that's a DeWalt wheelbarrow. And that thing's going down I-75. What's, what's that dumb redneck Michigander doing? And we're like, hey, now it doesn't say I can't. Here I go. According to this article, it says, not surprisingly, this is a problem. A paper published in the Harvard Business Review. This, this concept actually took space in a Harvard Business Review article. Concluded that the U.S. warning label fails miserably at distinguishing between large and small risks. In fact, this is what their idea, they said consumers should think about the difference between wolves, potentially dangerous, and puppies, not so much. Their words, not mine. I, I read that as getting ready for this particular sermon. I thought, well, that's an interesting concept. Is, is this product a wolf or a puppy? Those of you who are puppy lovers, where's my wife? What they're saying is both are dangerous. Can I get an amen out there, Miss Kaylee? Both are dangerous. Wolf, but Pastor Dylan says amen. Both are dangerous. But, but no, they said that some are a problem. And we gloss over them because we've seen so many of them. We've become callous to the warning labels because it seems like everything has a warning and everything says danger and everything says stop. And if we're not careful, we will adapt the mentality that nothing can hurt us. In fact, there was a couple of signs that I saw. One said this, warning, baiting deer is illegal. That is true, it is illegal in Michigan right now. It says this corn pile is intended for squirrels and chipmunks and other such animals. Any deer found eating this corn will be shot. <laughs> Very appropriate deer hunters to become a deer hunting season. Another one I saw that I thought was appropriate was on an on a, a electric fence. It said danger... And if that isn't enough to prevent you from touching a wire fence, then by all means go ahead and see what high voltage feels like. See, we come to this passage and we have a warning, a caution, danger ahead. 
But I submit that at times as Christians, as we read God's word, as we hear God's word preached, we get the idea that everything has a caution. Everything is danger. Everything is a warning. Hey, be careful about this and be cautious about this and watch your attitude about this and watch your mind about this and watch your steps about this. And if we're not careful, we'll approach this passage like we do warning labels on things in this earth where we're like, oh, okay, no big deal. Set it aside and continue on our merry way. Can I submit to you that the the Bible, when it gives us a caution, when the Bible gives us a warning, we ought to listen to it. It does not speak just because it needs something to fill some pages. It's in there because the Holy Spirit, uh, directing John, the apostle, knew that this was going to be an issue, was a big deal, and this is inspired by God for us in 2019. This, this, this section, this passage of Scripture warns us of false teachers, of false teaching, and of false trails. False teachers, false teaching, and false trails. Because in this world as we live, there will be different exits on the path of our path to the Savior, and in walking in the Savior, that want to lure us off the path of righteousness, the path of truth, and really bring error in our life. And I'm afraid, as we live this life as Christians, that too many Christians see these warning signs, danger ahead, danger ahead, and fly right past them without a second thought. They, they take it like they do the Tylenol bottle. Oh, that doesn't look too bad. This won't hurt me too much. Glug, 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 glug. And then when their life is in disarray, when their emotions are completely out of control, when their family is in serious turmoil, when their job is upside down, when they have no sense that it seems of right or wrong, then they say, hey, how did I get here? And then they go on to say, God, how did you let me get here? I thought you would be with me. I thought you'd walk with me. I, I thought you'd help me. And, and it is, in a sense, you look at this and say, well, God is helping us. He's giving us the truth from God's word for, to apply to our lives. And as he says in this passage, look out for this and look out for this and be careful. Caution, danger ahead. So as we look at this passage, I'd ask that we would, we would be attentive to it, that we would apply the truth that John brings and surpass the culture and the time that John was in, the truth surpassed that. They bring to us in 2019 an idea of what to be careful of. I like to look of all, first of all, the environment. I see in this passage the environment. John says this, that, that little children, in verse 18, it is the last time. It seems like there's hardly a, a week that goes by that some Christian author or writer or something that says, we are living in the end times. And little doubt in my mind that Christ could come back today. He could come back today. And in fact, the disciples thought and believed that Jesus would come back while they were still alive. John is saying, listen, he goes, little children, uh, the one that I love and the ones that I have nurtured in the faith and the ones that I've written to a couple times this passage and called little children a, a term of affection and love, he says, listen, we are, we are in the last time. And while that last time is now stretched out for John to be about 2,000 years, remember that with God, time is, is very, on a different, very different scale. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. So this is nothing in God's economy on time. And John says, listen, I'm in the last time right now. And, and, and wouldn't you know it that the world doesn't seem to have gotten much better? And wouldn't you know it that since A.D. 85, about when this book was written to 2019, uh, uh, people aren't more spiritual, are they? It doesn't seem like we've gotten a culture that's, that's more in tune with godliness and more in tune with righteousness. It, it is the last time. It's still in the last times. It was most likely this book was written in Ephesus. I read up on the history of Ephesus, and some of you are, are great history buffs. And some of the, the temple that was in Ephesus and what happened in this and, and some of the uh, ideas and religions that those Christians in Ephesus specifically would have faced. They would have faced one that exalted knowledge. They would have faced a, an idea that knowledge was to be exalted. Isn't that interesting? We live in 2019. What do they call the what age? Information age, where knowledge is exalted. 
you have a question about anything, you can Google it. It is now a verb. In the past tense, I Googled it. If you want to learn how to do something, you can pull up a video service called YouTube and about anything that you want to do, someone has probably done and made a video about it. You want to remove this particular brakes out of this particular model and this particular series with a, this particular rust spots, someone has it. And they'll say, do this and then do this and do this and, and uh, this will happen. If you hear this noise, stop. You too. Hey, if you want to find some crazy recipe, you can look on ladies on Pinterest, right? You don't, don't know what you can make for the Christmas party, but look on Pinterest and, and some lady in some other crazy state with a lot more time than we have has made something beautiful and it looks like it only takes 13 seconds. If you want to go better than that, if you need help decorating, you, you look over there. We live in the information age and in fact, John references that in verse number 20, and ye know all things. He references the, the contrast to Christians. And so John is saying in this time, it is the last time that the time is late in the Christian uh, e ecosystem, in God's economy on time, and the time has not got any less since this book was written. Understand that we still live in the end of times. We're even closer, obviously, to the coming of Jesus Christ than John was. And we can say with John in Revelation, even so come Lord Jesus. Hope he comes quickly. Hope he comes tonight. Hope he comes this week. The time is short. In the environment, we live in the last times. Throughout the Bible, uh, the apostles in the New Testament talk about things that will be happening in the end times, the last times. The way people will act and the way people will live. This is one of those passages because I also see the trouble of this time in this environment. Where John says, you've heard that the Antichrist shall come, a very specific individual. And we absolutely believe that in the end time, during the, the tribulation time, the seven-year period, all right, where Christians are raptured, and we're not around for that. I don't believe in mid-tribulation theory, where we're raptured at three and a half years in. I don't believe in post-trib uh, idea, where we're raptured after this. I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. Before it happens, we're going to be raptured out of here. I don't have time to discuss all of that. If you have a question, come see me later, and I'll show you the Bible while I believe that. All right, a pre-trib. But during that tribulation time of seven years and the three-and-a-half-year mark, the Antichrist, the one who is uh, the, the father of some of the deception, will rise up. I believe who John is referencing here, that particular figure in the end time specifically. But he goes on to say that, that not only that it's the Antichrist, but he says even now, are there many Antichrists? Now, in our current culture and Christian culture, to call someone an Antichrist is a pretty hefty slam. Is it not? If I said, Brother John... You know, you're living so wickedly. Of course, it's you, Brother Goldsworthy. You're living so wickedly, I think you're the Antichrist. <laughs> is that you, Sydney, or is that Mary, one of you? Okay, I got an amen. Hey, well, oh, or, or was that Carrie? That might have been Carrie, his wife. But, but if I said that, you know, Brother John, you're the Antichrist, that would not be a slight slam to Brother John Goldsworthy, now would it, as a Christian? It would not be used lightly. It would not be something that we would joke around with. Oh, look at that. A lot of antichrists in this room tonight. It's a very hefty, a very serious term. So when John introduces us to this word, there is a, a weightiness to it, a heftiness to it. This word antichrist means this, opponents of the Messiah, opponents of the Christ. Now, what I find interesting about this verse is that, of course, we know of the great Antichrist in the tribulation time, but John says along the way, in this time right now, there are going to be other opponents to Jesus Christ. There are going to be other people who are opposed to the Messiah, to opposed to his way, opposed to his truth, opposed to his teaching, opposed to his gospel. Those are Antichrist. They're opponents of the Messiah. And he says, caution, danger ahead. You see, this is not just an alternate idea. A nice little rabbit trail. A different take. Uh, you got a different perspective on this. You see, that's what unsaved or someone who is in this would have us to think. They say things like this, well, of course, you view the Bible this way, and I'll view it this way. 
Like then we should stop back and stand back and say, oh, okay, well, you can view it this way, I view it this way. Almost like they want to compare this idea to whether you like McDonald's better or Burger King better. You like McDonald's and I'll eat at Burger King and you'll be fine and I'll be fine and, and, and I won't go there, you won't go there, everyone will be happy. That is the farthest thought from this passage. When he brings us this word, antichrist, he's speaking of opponents of the Messiah. He gives us some background about these particular people that he is referred to now as antichrist. In verse number 19, he says, they went out from us. The background is they actually came from the teachings of the apostles and even the apostle John. He's not just referencing some random individuals. John says, these antichrists, they came out from under my teaching. They heard the truth that I gave. They, they were inside of it, not just a random interaction with the truth. They came out from among us, but they were not of us. They were known. They were known of the believers. In fact, I would have believed that the other believers would know specific people that John would have been referring to when he said, these are antichrists. And he's warning about them. And he said, listen, you know these people. You know where they sat. You know what they heard. You know what they experienced. And you know how they walked away. Their background was such that, that they were known of the, of the believers, of the disciples. They also were known, or they knew the truth. They made a choice to leave the path. They made a choice to look at the truth from John and from the gospel and from Jesus Christ himself. That's what John references in a few verses later. And they decided, they made the choice to walk away. And understand something, anytime that we walk away from truth, anytime we walk away from truth, we're walking away and become an anti-Christ. Now let me argue this point very clearly so you don't miss what I'm saying. James says it this way, Brethren, if one of you do err from the truth, walk away from the truth. You know why it's a big deal? Because John 14, verse 6, the same writer, John 14, verse 6, quotes his Savior. And he quotes the Savior where Jesus says this, I am the way, help me, the truth, the life. Jesus is the truth. When someone walks away from the truth, who are they walking away from? Jesus himself. And to walk away from the truth is not to be with Christ, but Jesus said, whoever's not with me is uh, against me. So to walk away from truth is to now become an anti-Christ, an opponent of the Messiah. There is not a middle ground. There is not a section in the middle that we can say, listen, I'm not for Christ. I'm not going to do everything he wants. But I'm not going to live like the devil over here. I'll just walk down the middle. No, you're either with Christ or you're anti-Christ. You're either following the Lord or you're not following the Lord. There are no, there's no middle ground in this. And John says there's a warning. You know these people. They sat where you sat. They heard what you heard. They experienced what you experienced. And they have walked away. And he calls them opponents of the Messiah, an antichrist. He said they made a choice. He said they were not of us. Verse 19, but they were, that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. He says they were revealed. They were shown who they were. Their true colors came out. The sincerity of their heart was revealed by the choices that were made. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. What comes in from the outside can't defile a man, but from what's in in can defile a man. And, and Jesus gave us a point that what is inside will ultimately be shown by out here. You see, how you live makes a difference because it shows what's going on inside your heart. If you have a heart for the Lord, you will desire to walk with the Lord. Does that mean you'll never mess up? Of course not. John has already dealt with that in chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. Remember, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. But the path is shown by the realness and trueness of the heart. And, John's, and John says, listen, little children, it's the last time, and I'm going to warn you, because there's going to be people that have sat where you sat, 
that have listened to what you've listened to, that have experienced what you've experienced, and they're going to walk away. Listen, you're going to know what they are by the choices they make. I would submit that we are known by how we live. Maybe you've met people like I have out soul winning. You give them the gospel and they say this, I'm saved. Say, that's wonderful. I don't go to church. Okay. In fact, I, I think I can, I can worship right here in my house. Okay. In fact, I don't want to go to church. They're known by their choices. I don't know if they're truly saved. They're not only, they do, and only God in heaven does that. Jesus knows that. I know that in that time, uh, uh, there will be some that will say, uh, Lord, Lord, how we, have we not cast out demons in thy names? And Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. But John says, listen, be careful. There are antichrists out there, and you'll know them by the path. They'll be made manifest. They'll be revealed. It is not the sense of judgment, but the sense of honesty that we come to this with. This past week, or about a little over a week now, I think it was past week actually, I'm in the process of refinancing my house. Rates have dropped, and it's been a good time to do that. The appraiser came out this past week. Interesting individual. I'm at my dining room table. It was about 11.30 or so, middle of the day. He comes out and give him a tract. Give him the Jessica tract. He looks at it and he goes, oh. He goes, I don't know really where I sit on this. I said, well, I'm a pastor at First Baptist Church. And we begin to talk. He said, I think, he said, I was raised Catholic. He said, and I don't think that was right. What do you think about that? Oh, please. Oh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, I do, actually. I talked about the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, you know, I don't go to church right now. I, I worship my own way. What do you think about that? <laughs> he said, I'm going to go check out your pole barn. I said, I'm going to walk with you out there. I'm not sitting inside any longer. I wasn't studying my sermon. I'm not sitting there any longer. We're in the pole barn. He said, I tried this other church. This is interesting. He's a Catholic. He's an unsaved man. He said, I tried that place, uh, he said, uh, Hopevale. His word, Hopevale. I said, okay. He said, you know what, uh, I was raised Catholic. He said, that was really different for me. I said, okay. He goes, in fact, he said, I left that. And I thought, he said, this is his words. He goes, I thought, that was like a rock concert. His words, not mine. He said, what do you think about that? I had to bite my tongue. I said, we're a little bit different at First Baptist Church. I said, we're definitely more traditional in our worship and service style. Amen? Amen. <laughs> On a side note, I don't think you'll walk in here and, convince, and, and confuse us with a rock concert. And I'm glad for that. There ought to be a difference at church. At church, it ought to be different. We're, we're coming to worship the God of the universe and the creator, the one who saved us from our sins, who died on the cross. There ought to be some distinction from other things that happen in this, in this world. But I could go for a while. That's an, old, that's an old sermon all by itself, just in case you're wondering. Don't get, me stopped, don't get me stopped there. He did not get saved. We talked all the way back up to his car. I sent him, a, I sent him the Dunn, wrote him a letter, and sent him the Dunn book. I got back to the office here. I'm supposed to hopefully come out here a couple weeks. I'm hoping for friend day. He said he would hopefully come to friend day to come to church. Search it. But boy, when he said that about another church, and I'm not here to talk about other churches, but it, it struck me about, about what we are dealing with in this day and age. Now, each church is their own. I'm not here to lambast another church or whatnot. I'm glad they're preaching the gospel. They're not our enemy. All right, the devil's our enemy. He's out there trying to destroy homes, destroy families, and destroy people's lives. He's doing it through alcohol, through drugs, through depression, and through adultery, and through immorality, and through entertainment. He, he's the enemy. But John says, be careful, be careful, because there will be other people out there who are anti-Christ. You see, I'm going to give you this thought in verse 20, but ye have an unction from the Holy One. I'm going to finish this up some next week, but I love that. Let me phrase it this way. Not original with me, but I love it. You have an unction to function. You have an unction to function. He says there are people out there 
There are people out there who are going to turn their back on Jesus Christ. There are people out there who have heard what you've heard. They've sat where you sat. They've lived where you've lived. And, and you've probably met those people. I used to be there at that church. I used to call myself a Christian, but now I don't. And, and John says, but you, but, but you have an unction, an anointing, an endowment, the power from the Holy One Himself. You have an unction to function. There's no excuse because you have the power of God in your life. And if you're not functioning correctly, then you're not functioning in the unction. You're doing it yourself. Eugene was born August 19, 1921. Not this Eugene. And his parents rented home in El Paso, Texas, the first child of Eugene and Carolyn. Eugene began to write scripts for television. His first series was aired on May 24th, 1966. After 13 episodes, there was a threat of cancellation. His first series, or uh, the first series was, was had a threat of cancellation. After many letters were written to the studio, it was renewed for a second season. At the end of that season, the same looming threat of cancellation was indeed in the works, and this time, Eugene organized a student march and, and a and over 6,000 letters a week showed up at NBC to keep his series going. Eventually, NBC capitulated, and the series continued on. Throughout his storied career, Eugene wrote script after script and even helped create the movie I, Robot. I'm sure you've heard of this man, Eugene. He goes by his, his shortened name, Gene, and his last name is Roddenberry. And the series he created was Star Trek. What you may not have known was that Eugene was raised a Baptist. Raised a Baptist, and as a child, he served and sang in the choir at his local church. Early in his writing career, he received an award for skillfully writing Christian truth and the application of Christian principles into commercial, dramatic TV scripts. Yet if you watch Star Trek, it would be a far cry from the religious Baptist background that Gene had. Early on in his teen life, he began to question religion and eventually came to the conclusion that it was all nonsense. He rejected as an adult religion and considered himself a humanist. In fact, he, uh, for several years, corresponded with someone at the National Council of Churches regarding the application of Christian teaching in television series. However, he wrote this in a letter, You must understand that I am a complete pagan and consume enormous amounts of bread Having found that the word, the Bible, more spice than nourishment, I'm interested in a statement couched in dollars and cents and what this means to the Roddenberry treasury. He said this of Christianity, how can I take seriously a God image that requires that I prostrate myself every seven days and praise it? That sounds to me like a very insecure personality. And he said, here's death, or before his death, he said this, it's not true that I don't believe in God. I believe in a kind of God. It's not just other people's God. I reject religion, but I accept the notion of God. By John's definition, this man left the truth. And Gene Roddenberry and people like him will be around us every week, it seems like. You can't go very far and not find someone else who has turned aside from the Christian truth. And sometimes it's a friend. Sometimes it's a coworker, Sometimes it's someone you sat to next to at church. Sometimes it's a pastor in another place, another city, another concept, and another, another thing. But, but John says, be careful because as long, as long as this earth continues, men and women will stray from the faith. But you have an unction from the Holy One. You have the power to function. There's a caution. There's danger ahead. You see, I look at Gene Roddenberry and I wouldn't trade places with him. He ended up with a lot more money than I'll ever have. But who cares? Who cares? If you look up his history as I did, you'll find out that he was sometimes in his career broke because he was paying child support because of a divorce. I want to follow the Lord and stay with my wife of my youth. I don't want someone else to separate that, stay in the truth. I 
am happy to prostrate myself every seven days on a Sunday and come and worship the God of the universe with fellow Christians. Sorry, Gene, you got it wrong. And Gene, you may not believe in God, but you will believe in God. You may think you had it wrong when you were young and singing in the choir, but you had it right. You had it right. Those songs you sang, Gene, when you were 12 and 13 years old, on Christ the solid rock I stand, that's a good song, Gene. You should have listened to that song. When we all get to heaven, Gene, you should have listened to that song. There's victory in Jesus. Gene, you should have listened to those songs you sang. You see, we have power from the Holy One. John gives us a warning, but he gives us the solution as well. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that you love us enough to give us warnings, to caution us. Lord, help us to seek your face. Lord, may we not just walk in this middle ground thinking we can walk away from you and it not matter. But Lord, may we strive to stay close to you, to abide in you. I wonder who would say, Pastor How, would you pray for me? As you spoke tonight, God spoke to me. Maybe I've been deceived in thinking that I could walk away from a truth, maybe even what we would view as, quote, a small truth, but I don't want to be labeled, as John says, an antichrist. I don't, want to, I don't want to be an opponent to the Messiah. Would you pray for me? I want to follow Christ in my life. And the Lord touched my heart today about an area in my life. Would you raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you. Amen. 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 Who else? Amen. That's me. Pray for me. Amen. Amen. Who else? I would say, Pastor John, would you pray for me? I want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy One, the unction. Would you pray for me that I wouldn't just do it myself, but I'd live in that power? Pray for me when you pray for the others. Who else says, that's me? Amen. 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 Lord, I thank you for these. Lord, I thank you for your truth. Would you bless this invitation? May we seek your face and your power and your will in Jesus' name. Amen.